I think grey squirrels are very attractive and they're genius and clever. They come in all over the place. They come into the bin, they come into the house. They even try to get in the wind up there. They are nice to see, but at the moment they're a blooming nuisance. Squirrels aren't a nuisance in our garden. We love to have them here. I think they're very pretty, these grey squirrels, but they're tree rats really, aren't they? I would like to have one as a pet, but I know there's no way I could have one. Squirrels are an absolute nuisance. They're a pest around here. They really are tree rats. Grey squirrels. It seems people either love them or hate them. If you live in town, the chances are you love them. It's a wild animal that's fun to watch, looks pretty, and which can become extraordinarily tame. Grey squirrels seem able to overcome their fear of man more readily than any other of our wild animals, when the reward's tempting enough. No wonder many city residents look on them with great interest and with great affection. But if you live in the countryside, you may well detest grey squirrels. For this reason, bark stripping. Every year, forestry suffers literally millions of pounds worth of damage by squirrels. They don't eat the bark. What they're after is the sweet sap underneath. But whatever your opinion, there's no denying this is a very successful animal. The secret of its success is the grey squirrel's mastery of its environment be it an English oak wood, a park like this one, or even a garden, whereas we'll see in this programme, bird lovers wage a good-natured war with squirrels that have become adept at stealing from feeders. There are three basic ingredients to that success. The first is a mate, the second is good shelter, and the third is food. Grey squirrels have been quick to exploit food put out for garden birds. They're natural opportunists. Bird tables certainly haven't deterred them. So, all over the country, bird lovers have devised a range of defences to keep squirrels off. But agility and perseverance soon enable the thieves to break and enter any defence. Wales, a real battle of wits was to be engaged between the most ingenious of urban squirrels and newly arrived resident, Mrs. Carol Doe. Moving up from the city, I was rather fascinated when I first came here to see the amount of birds that came into the garden. Little did I know that World War III was about to break out between me and some rather furry creatures with long tails. Anyway, I put out a couple of red nut nets and they either disappeared or I'd find them buried, but they just weren't there. So I decided to do it on the washing line, thinking that they couldn't get up the pole. I was wrong. They went up the pole, they crawled along the line, they fell off once or twice at first, but they, they did it, they persevered. And they would just pull the red net up and they just unhook it and it would drop on the ground. So for many householders, the next obvious step to foil the beasts was to hang the bird food somewhere even more inaccessible. Using its tail as a counterbalance, the grey squirrel's natural agility can be developed into a talent for tightrope walking on even the thinnest of wires. It proved to be its most useful aid to robbery so far. This squirrel can see the food, but it has to learn the circuitous route it must take to its goal. After only a few days, the animal does it, start to finish in just 24 seconds. And that time includes breaking and entering the container while hanging upside down.
In Budley in Worcestershire, Mrs. Winnell and her family were getting fed up with the squirrels using her washing line as a free al fresco restaurant. Realising the impossibility of hanging the food where the squirrels couldn't get it, she tried another tack, stop them getting up the pole in the first place. But such is the persistence of the animal that partly by rubbing off the grease on its fur and partly by sheer momentum, it makes it in the end. For Mrs. Winnell, it's back to the drawing board. When the squirrel gets his food, he's well equipped to deal with it. Just look at the way this chap deals with the hard husk of an acorn. You put it into his mouth and those lower incisors will separate slightly to provide support. And then as he's turning it like that, he'll find the right place and then the two incisors will come together in a sharp chisel edge and he split the husk and it falls straight away. He's really munching into it now. All that chewing and gnawing wears the squirrel's teeth very rapidly. But like all rodents, they've got specialised teeth that grow continually throughout the animal's life, constantly replacing the enamel that gets worn away every time the squirrel eats. And that's because their most important food, tree seeds, come in a hard outer shell, like this acorn. Grey squirrels were introduced to our parks a hundred years ago from North America. They're much more at home on the ground than our native red squirrels, and it's down here that sooner or later much of the food falls in autumn. Squirrels save time and energy by using their front paws like a pair of scales, turning the nut to assess its weight. If it's heavy, like this one, it's worth opening. Any lighter and it'll be discarded. Autumn's the time when the annual supply of all that tree seed arrives in one big delivery. Grey squirrels are specialists in making the most of this plenty, finding their way into the most difficult of tree seeds with great determination and care. Back in Hollywell, the squirrel's teeth were to prove the undoing of a now more determined Carol Doe. Stage two was a wooden box because I thought the net, the nut net, the red nut net was far too easy, so I went to a wooden box. Again, I put it on the washing line because I thought, well, at least this time they won't be able to knock it off the line. We were wrong yet again. There's one particular squirrel which we call Rambina. She would go along the red line, drop down and eat the nuts, but she wasn't getting enough this way. In the end, what she would do was she would cut through the actual line because she discovered then that the box would drop on the floor and all the nuts would fall out the back. But that wasn't all. The squirrel had also learned to turn the container so the filler hole was underneath and then to shake it so all the nuts fell out. Not a stoat in ermine, but a white grey squirrel, a true albino with the characteristic pink eyes. Albinism in grey squirrels is relatively common, although this one's unusually white. But what a sight for any householder to see such an animal feeding on his bird table. The result of all that feeding is to gain weight and get yourself in good condition for breeding. But first, the female squirrel must ensure that she has the second of those ingredients for success, good shelter. These tree nests are called drays. It's basically just a, a hollow sphere with a superstructure built out of twigs and dried leaves. And the squirrel will line the inside here with moss and dry grass so that it's nice and soft. It might be looking a bit scruffy, but it's probably taken the squirrel several days to build it, and it could last for many years, although this is just a lightweight summer nest and it'll probably be gone by the end of the season. Now, the female squirrel that's going to use this dray may have two litters a year, one in the spring and one later on in the summer. That gives her the potential to produce lots of young and essential for success. The male squirrel, on the other hand, plays no part in this at all. All his effort goes into the elaborate squirrel courtship, the mating chase. 
When a female squirrel comes into oestrus, males will arrive from the surrounding area to court her. They find her using that sense of smell, and as the first approaches, she signals her readiness by allowing him to follow close behind her as she sets off through the trees. Other males keep a close watch on this following behaviour and may challenge to take part at any time. Eventually the pace quickens to the mating chase as one male tries to get close enough to the female to mate. And at last, he succeeds. One of the main things that's made it so easy for grey squirrels to exploit us is their fantastic agility. They're superbly adapted for life in the trees. They've got these long hind limbs that provide the power for spectacular leaps and little short stubby front limbs that act like shock absorbers when they land. They've got five long toes on the back and four on the front, all with sharp curved claws that provide excellent grip. Squirrels have also got double jointed hind feet, which means they can go just as easily down as they can come back up again. Now the other great aid to the squirrel's arboreal way of life is this tail. This chap's in his summer molt, so it looks a bit moth-eaten. But it's not only just used for signalling, as we've just seen, but also it provides an excellent rudder for their massive mid-air leaps. Back at Carol Doe's, battle was now well and truly underway. It became obvious that something had to be done to stop the squirrels going up the pole. My husband had bought me a Tony Soper bird book, and in there it gave instructions for a baffle. So, following the instructions, I got an old sweet tin, placed it on the pole. Well, at first they would leap round it, so I moved the baffle up higher and higher, and in the end it did actually stop them going up the pole. But they discovered that if they go to the apple tree, they could just leap straight from my apple tree, straight onto the line, ignoring the baffle completely. One back garden in Finchley in London saw a whole gamut of anti-squirrel devices invented by Mr. Tony Collins. My personal battle against squirrels began about seven years ago when I hung a container on the clothesline for the birds and within an hour watched a squirrel come along the clothesline, not underhand like a commando, but more on top like a ballet dancer, destroyed the container and got away with half a pound of peanuts. I tried various methods of putting stoppers on the line to stop the squirrel getting at the nuts. So he just bit through the line and stole the whole container and I never saw it again. So then I purchased a squirrel-proof container which worked for about three months until the squirrel found that by hanging on the side he could tip it up and the nuts ran down the central cylinder straight into his mouth. So then I had to think up another wheeze and I decided on the water cannon. That was the hose fixed up through the bottom of a flower pot aimed at the container so every time he got on it, I gave him a jet of cold water where he didn't like it. That deterred him for several weeks until he learned that every time I passed the kitchen window to turn the tap on, he knew what was coming and I never scored another hit. Hawthorne Cottage in deepest Kent among all the enthusiastic amateurs we've seen so far, the home of one professional. Jacoby Jane and company are interested in the design and manufacture of squirrel-proof bird feeders using the latest computer technology. It all started when Jane Carter saw how badly made many bird feeders were, and that wasn't all. We found that the squirrels also were able to eat through feeders that were hanging up, 
and in fact seem to enjoy the taste of the feeders as much as their contents. So we set out to manufacture a long-lasting bird feeder that was not only weatherproof, but totally squirrel-proof as well. The metal feeding ports are specifically designed to resist squirrels' teeth, so too the tough polycarbonate plastic, and there's some very clever anti-squirrel accessories. So for those people who want a 100% squirrel-proof feeder, we have two forms of squirrel guard. There's the baffle, which will stop squirrels coming up from underneath, and there's the squirrel guard dome, which will stop the squirrels coming down from above. We field tested the feeder and its accessories. The baffle worked, the dome foiled the leapers. The squirrels saw all their efforts frustrated, but persevered, one at a lower level and one up in the branches. It then tried abseiling down, watched by its companion, only to be foiled by the slippery surface of the dome. But the squirrels won in the end, because we'd hung the feeder less than the recommended distance of eight feet from trees, and by a prodigious leap, upwards and outwards. It finally made it. And back at Carol Doe's. I decided that something had to be done. So I wrote to the Natural History Unit of the BBC. One morning, the postman came staggering down my drive with this very large brown parcel. On opening it, I found this huge bird box. It was heavy, it was complicated, but it worked. It's an American designed and built feeder, not available in this country. Expensive, but effective. The principle is simple. When the squirrel puts its weight on the platform, the opening to the food closes. And being sturdily built of metal, even the most frustrated squirrel's teeth can't damage it. The ease with which the squirrels have conquered almost all the feeders we've seen so far, despite some ingenious anti-theft devices, surely demonstrates an animal that's versatile, dexterous and, above all, agile. But perhaps on some of the more complex feeders, we've seen something a little bit more than just a hit-and-miss effort. The squirrels are certainly using their memories, and their persistent and opportunistic nature means that they're able to use that simple trial-and-error learning to maximum effect. But so far, we haven't really stretched them at all, and that's what we're going to do now. We've devised something so fiendishly difficult, you can really call it a grey squirrel assault course. And this is it. Now, the food is up there, but the squirrel can't simply run up the pole to that because of this baffle. He's got to work out first that all the action starts over 45 feet that way. And after he's done that, he's still got a lot of work to do. It took just two days before the squirrel learnt to climb the first pole, then another two days to learn to cross the first rope to the tunnel, five more days to get the trick of the seesaw, another day to negotiate the chain using either the underarm or the overarm technique. And by the end of a fortnight, they were climbing the chimney, but still hadn't geared themselves up for that final leap. It's just two weeks and two days since the assault course was set up, and already we've had news that the first grey squirrel cracked it yesterday. I've come here to see that for myself. Hopefully what I'm going to see is one of our most successful and our most accessible wild mammals using its natural behaviour to exploit us. And 20 minutes later, there he was, preparing for his record-breaking run as I watched from the window. Along the first rope bridge, through the first tunnel. Out the end and jump to the seesaw, let it fall forward and leap to the next platform. Quick scratch and along the chain to the second tunnel with two one-way doors. Along the third rope, up the chimney and into that final leap. Then down to the food, 25 seconds flat. So join me, sit back and watch again this brilliant feat of daylight robbery. up 
up next, explore the wild side of your pet dog as Discovery Sunday continues with A Wolf in Your Living Room, only on the Discovery Channel. on Daylight Robbery 1. He's back. Your response to the star of our first film, The Ultimate Bird Table Burglar, has really left us with no choice. You sent us so much brilliant ammunition for the back garden battle against this little fella that we just had to throw down the gauntlet for a second time. Remember this? famous shot from Daylight Robbery 1 was afterwards used by the world of advertising, perhaps inappropriately, to sell lager. Many people thought that we'd trained the squirrels, but in fact they were wild animals giving us all a breathtaking demonstration of their own natural behaviour. We think we can do better. Here we are in the same back garden with the next generation of wild squirrels, and we think we can test them even further with this super assault course. They start with a chimney, just like going up a drain pipe, and then across onto this windmill, which must be a bit like climbing in the top of a windy tree for a squirrel. Over onto a platform, through a hole in this perspex disc, and then down the chain, through a spinning disc, and then on and through another. The next stage is a perspex box, inside which there's a, a revolving door, through that and then into this canvas tunnel, out of the other end, and then onto this pole, which is covered in spinning rollers. The squirrel has to climb along there, onto a platform at the end, a six-foot leap to this very large perspex tube, inside which there's a little red rocket, and the squirrel has to sit on the back, shoot all the way down here, and come out of this other end. And then to finish with, a massive eight-foot leap to the ultimate goal for the squirrel, which is the food. Immediately, the wild squirrels are eager to discover how to tackle this 50-foot-long, rather odd-looking series of trees. But there's food there somewhere. And squirrels don't just blunder in. They sit and watch and then decide where to start. But learning the whole course will take time. Squirrels everywhere appear cheeky, but they're really just taking advantage of a good opportunity. It knows what it wants is in there somewhere. is that grey squirrels are extremely bold and they seem to fear little. For many people that boldness has benefits. A wild squirrel which comes when you call. But in Britain, it's not only grey squirrels that might visit your back garden. If you're really lucky, it could be one of our native red squirrels raiding your bird feeder. And because they're now so rare, people tend not to mind so much. 
For Mrs. Richards of Aberdeenshire in Scotland, there isn't a better animal to see or photograph. Britain. The season when trees shed millions of seeds. it's time to fill a winter's buried larder. <whistles> Meanwhile, back at the assault course, a squirrel is attempting the first few stages. A little more time to work it out, perhaps. It's here in the United States of America that gray squirrels have evolved the natural behavior that's helped them to become the ultimate bird table burglar. There are millions of square miles of ancient hardwood forests here, and the variety of tree species is enormous. But unlike Britain, there's competition from other squirrels for the food that those trees produce. Small wonder that gray squirrels, then, have had to learn to be opportunistic. This one is licking the sweet sugary sap oozing from the surface of some tree bark. Here, as in Britain, squirrel highways extend from the ground to the top of the highest tree canopy. That may be able to help them escape most native predators, but not all. A young red-tailed hawk. Some grey squirrels are black. They're a melanistic variety that can make up one third of the population in places, and both greys and blacks interbreed. The fox squirrel is slightly larger than the grey, with an extra bushy tail to go with its name. It seeks out food in the more open parks and gardens. Phil Davis from Maryland has another special guest who visits his bird feeder. He always puts out suet for woodpeckers that live close by. A red-bellied woodpecker. But his special visitor only arrives after dark. The suet is rich in fat, high in calories, essential for a small, active mammal.
Park, New York, the heart of the Big Apple, and also the home of urban grey squirrels. We're used to seeing these little fellas in our British towns and cities now, but this Native American has even managed to slot himself into this green oasis, where all around people are crammed in shoulder to shoulder. But if you think he's just restricted to the park, you'd be mistaken. Quite by chance, one grey squirrel was filmed discovering a way of unlocking the mechanism of a chocolate vending machine. Daylight robbery, American style. In the back streets of downtown Washington, D.C., Iris Rothman has an apartment and balcony on the fourth floor. Every day, she waits for her squirrels to visit her. Telephone cables and fire escapes are perfect highways for the squirrels. Up to 20 individuals come to visit her, and she has a name for everyone. Birds also come to her 10 foot by 10 foot balcony. So important is it for wildlife, it's been officially declared an urban wildlife sanctuary. Close by is the most famous house in all America, the White House. Gray squirrels have successfully made their homes here too. While President Eisenhower hated them for digging up the lawn he used to practice his golf, President Reagan loved to feed them whenever he had the chance. So impressed was he with the squirrels that he commissioned a Christmas card showing the White House in snow with one tiny grey squirrel coming to visit. But the grey squirrel isn't always so welcome in American homes. Here in the United States, if you want to feed the birds, then you're going to have to feed the squirrels. And that means that squirrel-proof bird feeders like this one are really big business. More people here feed birds than go hunting, shooting or fishing. And the industry which supplies them is one of the fastest growing in the country. Whole shops are devoted entirely to selling bird feeding equipment. There's already an enormous variety, but people are thinking up new ideas all the time. But most of them don't last long. Casualties in a war where we're easily the losers. Take, for example, this huge American metal bird feeder that we claimed was totally squirrel-proof when we tested it here in Britain in the last program. The squirrel simply cannot get at the nuts inside the box because the platform it has to stand on shuts off the only way to reach them. much to the annoyance of the squirrels. But even this ingenious and expensive feeder has now been cracked by the squirrels. Probably by chance, two help one another. One stands on the front platform as usual, but another counterbalances at the back, so this one can reach in to get a tasty walnut. Meanwhile, back at the new assault course, there's been a little progress. These rollers are proving difficult to hold on to.
back garden in London's sunny suburbia, a frustrated bird lover has come up with a more stunning way of preventing squirrels burgling his bird table. A mild electric shock frightens the squirrel. It's a sting, but quite harmless. Although shaken by the experience of the most sinister of devices yet, the squirrel doesn't give up. If birds can fly safely to the feeder, well, so too can the squirrel. Meanwhile, Howard Jackson puts the final touches to his latest design. Roy Harvey's decided to try a different tack. Discs that roll around an inner metal rod. So now he can replace his wire with what looks more like the latest satellite technology rather than a squirrel-proof feeder. Eventually, Roy Harvey hopes to market his design. But by far the simplest squirrel-proof bird feeder must be this one. It's a bird cage which allows small birds to come and go freely. But it prevents squirrels from reaching the peanuts. The designer of this particular one was intrigued by our original program. Now he too hopes to market it, both here and abroad. Is this the ultimate squirrel-proof design? How long will it be before this one's defeated? Back at the assault course, and we've just heard that the squirrels have cracked it. So I'm going upstairs to watch. It's taken the squirrels just over a month to learn how to complete the whole obstacle course. So it's up the chimney. A leap to the windmill. And onto the next platform. A quick scratch through the discs and along the chain, overarm and underarm. Into the box with the revolving door and through into the canvas tunnel, just like a hollow branch. Across the rollers with a lightning dash, a brash six-foot leap right into the most alien apparatus, the rocket, and a final eight-foot leap to the food.
It took the squirrels a little longer to learn this more difficult assault course, but once they got the hang of it, there was no stopping them. Over 20 trips a day for one individual is the record so far. Uh -huh.